Lesson six, pretty long chapter. Of course, in college, university, you would take a semester to a two-semester course in organic chemistry. And biochemistry, which is what this is going to be more about, at least at the beginning of this screencast, is all organic chemistry applied to living systems. Thinking about glucose, this simple sugar, a simple sugar is also known as a monosaccharide. There are also double sugars, which would be disaccharides way over here on the right. And then you can have trisaccharides, but at this point we use the prefix poly. So polysaccharides are made up of many sugars that are concatenated or connected side by side in big long chains. A good example of that would be starch, which would be a polymer, a big long chain of monosaccharides. Saccharide, of course, is another word for sugar. And uh, glucose is also an example of an organic compound that has both the hydroxyls and, on occasion, the car carbonyls uh, that we've been studying in the previous screencast. So, uh, the word carbohydrate obviously has the word carbon in it, and it has the word hydrate in it. And the reason for the name carbohydrate was because a while back, I don't know if it's a century or so, when they studied the structure and tried to determine, I should say, the elemental composition of carbohydrates, they knew that there were carbon and they knew that there was a two to one ratio of hydrogens to oxygens, otherwise known as water. And so the idea was that maybe a carbohydrate was simply a chain of carbons that had water molecules attached to it. So, for example, when you study over here on the left, um, glucose, you have six carbons, either in a chain or a ring, and it has 12 hydrogens and six oxygens because it's empirical form, not empirical, but it's molecular formula, is C6H12O6. The empirical formula would be CH2O, simplest whole number ratio. And they looked at that and they said, oh, maybe the structure of the carbohydrate is a chain of carbons with water molecules uh, so, uh, attached to it in place of hydrogens. Well, that turned out not to be correct, but the name carbohydrate has stuck. Um, carbohydrates are said to be polyhydroxyl, and you've got to get used to the vocabulary and know your prefixes and suffixes in science. Um, the English language has hundreds of thousands of chemical names in it, more than perhaps any other category. Um, carbohydrates are polyhydroxyl aldehydes or ketones. And glucose is an interesting example of this. We have three different isomers of the glucose molecule pictured here. Isomer number one is this chair structure. Isomer number two is a straight chain. Remember, straight means zigzag. And isomer number three is this chair structure over here, where you have a slightly different arrangement of this part. Um, now, the red dots that I put in show you why there are six carbons. And the main reason I did this was because at first glance, you would think that there are only five carbons in the chair structure. Every place you get an angle is a carbon, and they would correspond to these. But over here, you've got six carbons, and I just circled over here, five carbons. But you have to look real carefully to see that one right there. That angle 
shows that um, you have a a carbon where that red dot is that the arrow is pointing to going to the hydroxyl. It's almost like you have the water molecule and you're getting rid of that hydrogen and attaching it to the rest of the structure. That's why it's bent. So if you're not careful, you wouldn't notice that sixth carbon. So you do have six carbons in the chair structure. And you'll notice the letter D, which stands for right-handed molecules. So for reasons we don't, do not entirely understand or know, the, um, your amino acids that make up proteins are all left-handed stereoisomers, chiral molecules, and your simple sugars, monosaccharides that make up carbohydrates, are all right-handed chiral molecules. There's the word chiral for you. And we already talked in an earlier broadcast that each of your isomers is called an, an antiomer. And whether or not they rotate the light to the left or the right when you shine polarized light on it determines whether they're left-handed or right-handed molecules. And again, just a reminder, when we synthesize a batch of amino acids or a batch of monosaccharides, they form almost a 50-50 mixture of left-handed and right-handed. And why nature, we could say the creator, has chosen left-handed for proteins and right-handed for carbohydrates is an interesting question. We're also trying to figure out uh, when we try to answer the question why, uh, we're not explaining a way God, but we're explaining the way and maybe the why the way God chose to do it this way. Um, we're trying to come up with a chemical method that just produces right-handed or just produces left-handed. And we've made very little progress, some, but not a lot, at least in terms of the most recent journal articles that have referenced this that I've come across. Now, because of all the presence of these carbonyls and hydroxyls, um, sugars are very soluble in water. And isn't that wonderful? Otherwise, where would Coca-Cola and Pepsi and root beer and all the other sugared flavored drinks that we enjoy um, be if you couldn't dissolve sugar in water? Some people drink way too much soda, which is way too much sugar. Um, sometimes I'll go months without ever having a soda. I just like water. Um, but it's, not, it's nice to have an occasional soda. Once again, if you want to know what is wise for, as far as your diet is concerned, you want moderation and variety. Moderation and variety. Except, of course, pizza. Pizza, as much as you want. And again, I'm being a little facetious there. <clears throat> All right, moving right along. Um, we know that sugars can undergo oxidation. And um, we know how important it is to test for sugar in the urine or blood when we talk about having um, too much or too little sugar, hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic, um, diabetes. Um, the sixth carbon sugar is called a hexose, because sugars end in O-S-E. Let me erase that. O-S-E for sugars. And your enzymes end in A-S-E. This is, again, fundamental biochemistry. Now, not all sugars necessarily end in O-S-E, and not all enzymes necessarily end in A-S-E. And occasionally you'll come across a word that ends in O-S-C that is not a sugar. For those of you that are just waking up or falling asleep, a hose is not a sugar. And in baseball, a base is not an enzyme. So it, this is just a general rule of thumb. It probably means that the technical name, the systemic name, the IUPAC name will end in OS or ACE for sugars and um, enzymes, which are a form of protein, category of proteins. 
Uh, but the everyday common name will not necessarily do that. <clears throat> now, the next thing we want to mention a little bit about is DNA, because DNA alternates between a phosphate and a sugar, phosphate and a sugar, phosphate and a sugar. And those form the sides of your ladder. And then when we do the rungs of the ladder, the, which are base pairs, um, the base pairs are, um, uh, let's see, adenine and thiamine and cytosine and guanine, which are amines, which we've already talked about. And the sugars are right here. This particular sugar for DNA is a deoxyribose. And D means from, or we have an oxygen that's missing from my ribose sugar. RNA uses a different sugar than DNA. DNA uses deoxyribose sugar. RNA uses ribose sugar. So, and this is the genetic code, the sequence of these base pairs for which there is no rule that says if you have one base pair, the next base pair has to be such and such. Um, it is completely determined um, by the original source of the information that dictates what these base pairs are and that is coded in the DNA. And of course, that original information comes from the source of all information, um, the Creator Himself. Just like amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, DNA is made up of building blocks called um, nucleotides. And a nucleotide would be a phosphorus sugar, half of the, what's going on here? There we go. One of those amino acids, one of those amines, um, maybe adenine, or thiamine, or cytosine, or guanine, and a sugar and a phosphate creates a nucleotide. And then on the other side, you're going to have a, another nucleotide. And so when we put those nucleotides in specific orders, we, we get the genetic code. You alter the genetic code, you mess up a protein, you have a mutation that's likely going to be very deleterious. Now, if you ever get a chance, you should watch the movie Attica. Attica is the name that comes from these, from the letters adenine, thiamine, cytosine, and then there's a guanine. And it's a fascinating movie about bioethics. Um, and, and we talk about having the genetically enhanced people. Attica is about how the genetically enhanced people are favored and the ordinary people with ordinary um, genes are, um, there, there's a prejudice against, a marginalization against. Other movies will reverse that. Other movies will have the ordinary people um, as being superior, and then they intentionally um, have themselves cloned, and these cloned people with better genes and younger genes are there, therefore become the body parts for the um, ordinary people. So it can go either way in bioethics, and the movies are already anticipating this. And it's, it, that's good because we should be thinking about these issues. So uh, uh, we have the amino acids form the sequence that's necessary to make a functional protein. Most um, sequences of amino acids are garbage. Um, very few actually make um, important construct, um, instructive uh, information-laden proteins that work. Same is true for DNA, which, of course, um, among many other things, codes for proteins. And then sugars, we, see, we put those into big, long chains to make our polysaccharides, including starch. Now, uh, another po uh, polysaccharide maybe the most abundant one on the planet, is cellulose, which makes up the fibrous material in plants. And starch and cellulose are almost 
isomers of each other. There's a slight change in them, which give them completely different properties, one of which is starch is digestible, cellulose is not. Cellulose is the fiber you need in your diet, but you get no nutritional value from cellulose at all. But you need the fiber in order to keep the plumbing, your, your small and large, your large intestines in particular, uh, functioning well in removing waste material. Um, during wartime, uh, for example, in World War II, tragically, a lot of the people in the concentration camps, especially Jews, were fed foods high in sawdust, basically cellulose. So in a sense, you could feel full, you could have a full stomach, you were not getting any nutritional value from that, so you were starving to death in the process. And in the cellulose, the, uh, oxy the, the bond, and I think it's in this point, actually goes this direction instead of this direction, creating something that is um, not digestible. A little bit of biochemistry there. Now here we have some naturally occurring carboxylic acids. We already mentioned a simple one, formic acid, with its C double O H being C with the uh, double bonded oxygen for the carbonyl. There's my hydroxyl. Here's where it's attached to a hydrogen. And of course, we can put carbon groups in place of that hydrogen to make other kinds of organic or carboxylic acids. This comes from ants. It's also part of the sting in an ant bite, if you ever get one of those. There are so many kinds of ants. Ants are fascinating. Um, when I was in the jungle, um, I would watch the ants, and there are these gigantic ants, and I don't know what size you're looking at, but these gigantic ants, ants would be almost as long as your thumb, called um, giant ants, and then you'd have these army ants that would eat everything in their way, uh, creating trails from food source to food source to nest. And you don't want to be sitting in the way of army ants. They just eat whatever is in front of them. But a fascinating place to, to see these um, army ants. And then you also have leaf cutter ants that bite off chunks of leaves and then carry them back. They look like They've got sit green sails on their back as they carry these chunks of leaves back to the nest underground. Um, and uh, then those uh, begin to decompose and form the food for the next generation of ants. You also have ants that follow these trails left behind by previous ants of an organic compound called a pheromone. A pheromone is an organic compound that has a odor that we can't detect, but ants can detect it. You might see dogs on occasion urinate in various places. They're actually marking their territory with a pheromone. And, and I've done this with ants before. I found a trail of ants, and the ants are marching one by one along that trail. And then if you shove the trail, if, it's in, if the trail is in some light dirt, if you sub the trail into a and move, shove the dirt into a trail, you can get the ants to go in a circle, following the pheromones, the chemical scent of the previous trail. Of course, um, the pheromones are involved in the mating process as well for animals. Now, um, anyway, that's formic acid and a, and a more discussion of these ants. Um, there's another kind of ant, as I remember in the jungle, that lived in trees, and they had this mutualistic relationship with the tree. And so trees compete, and if you're a smaller tree in the jungle, it's hard to outcompete the bigger trees uh, for food and nutrients in the soil. So the army ants would basically eat anything that's growing in the area or any animals that comes in the area. So if this is kind of a tree, and there's the trunk of the tree. They clear out the all the land in the base of the tree. And so if anything comes into the area and comes near the tree, like a person, all these ants will come out of the tree and attack and keep that area cleared so that they, there's no competition for the tree that the ants are living in as far as food and water is concerned. 
So a little discussion of ants. Ants are insects, class Insecta, and phylum Orthoptera, and class Diptera. Remember that from 10th grade. So benzoic acid is in berries, back to here, and you can see your C-O-O-H attached to your benzene ring, or you could say this is a phenyl attachment, P-H-E-N-Y-L, whenever the benzene ring is an attachment. Citric acid, you remember from the lab, is diprotic, one, two, three. Remember the acidic hydrogen in, in C-O-O-H is the H in the hydroxyl group. The hydrogen attached to the carbon is never the acidic hydrogen. By acidic hydrogen, I mean the one hydrogen that is donated when the molecule acts like an organic acid. So it's always the H connected to the hydroxyl group that is the acidic hydrogen. So citric acid is triprotic. Lactic acid is monoprotic. You find it in sour milk, but it also accumulates when you do a strenuous exercise and, and when your respiration runs out of available oxygen, um, it begins to go to in sort of a more anaerobic metabolism and it produces lactic acid as a byproduct, which stores up in the blood and begins to cause your muscles to feel kind of stiff and sore. And then you've got to stop and breathe heavily and break down that lactic acid to get back to normal. Uh, malic acid is in apples. It's diprotic. Oleic acid is in vegetable oils as opposed to stearic acid, which is in animal fats. And of course, oils and fats are often used to make soaps and detergents. And they have lots and lots of carbons in them. And please note right here that we can simplify the condensed structural formula by putting a repeated part in parentheses, and this repeats seven times, and seven times on this side. And down here, you can see it repeats 16 times. And so this end is nonpolar, and this end of the stearic acid molecule is polar because of the C-O-O-H. And so this part is going to dissolve in water, polar, like dissolves like, and this part can dissolve the nonpolar things, and that's why we use animal fats um, and vegetable oils to make soaps and detergents. Um, and I used to do a lab decades ago uh, with my class where we actually made our own soap from animal fats and alcohol, just like they did in pioneer days. Tartaric acid is diprotic, and we find it in grape juice and in wines. And so some of our bullet points, the polar end of your molecule, the, the um, carboxylate, or if it's a two-carbon chain, the acetic acid part, the polar will dissolve in water. And then, of course, as the acid gets longer and longer and longer in the number of carbons, it becomes less soluble because you've got the nonpolar end, which in a sense doesn't know that there's a polar end and vice versa, but also the intermolecular forces increases the bigger the molecule because of the stronger and stronger London forces. That is to say, the stronger and stronger induced dipole forces. Um, and again, the acidic hydrogen is the one that's in the hydroxyl group. Organic acids are generally weak acids as opposed to strong acids, which readily lose their hydrogen. So you should memorize the strong acids. And notice that your strong acids for the, for, are basically non-organic. Um, you, your strong acids being HCl, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, um, then perchloric and hydroiodic and hydrobromic. You'll notice that these are not organic acids. They are weak acids. Uh, you also can have reduction of the acid, to, to, again, to turn into aldehydes and then later into um, other organic compounds. Um, let's see, uh, we can get breads to rise, looking over here, either by our yeast um, organisms. Yeast is in the mold fungus category, and when it metabolizes sugars, it produces carbon dioxide, 
which enables the bread to rise and get circles in it because it feeds on sugars um, and it feeds on carbohydrates. But you can also use acetic acid uh, to help with this process. So here are some various carbo carboxylic acids from one carbon to two carbon. And of course, one is meth, two is eth, but nobody calls acetic acid ethanoic acid, except for the honors chemistry book that we've been using for years. And then we have our three carbon chain, our four carbon chain. And of course, once you get this many carbons, you can begin to have isomers that would look like this and, and so forth. Notice that your boiling points are going to go up because your molar masses are going up, implying stronger and stronger polarities um, or dipoles, I should say, from um, your dip induced dipole, induced dipole. So we can go from our carboxylates to our aldehydes to our alcohols. And if you stop the screencast for a minute and look at this, you can see how we go from how my oxidation number for carbon goes from a plus three down to a plus one, down to a minus one, as we are reducing um, uh, our organic compound and using a reducing agent, the opposite of an oxidizing agent. Oxidizing agents would have lots of oxygens. Reducing agents would have lots of these hydrogens. Now let's talk about esters. Esters are going to have, like carboxylates, both a double bonded oxygen and a single bonded oxygen. So, for example, if I have a, go back to my simplest acid, we, we're going to talk about my organic acid as, as having a double bonded oxygen and a single bonded oxygen. And this is at the end or the beginning of a chain of carbons. Well, what if we put it in the middle of a chain? So what if we put a carbon here? Our groups, our groups are primed. And off of here, we have my uh, double bonded oxygen. So when I have a double bonded oxygen and a single bonded oxygen in the middle of my chain of carbons, as opposed to the end or the beginning of my chain of carbons, I now have an ester. And esterification would be, how do you make an ester in an organic synthesis? And esterification, or the making of esters, involves the combining of an organic acid with an organic alcohol. Remember, organic acids would not include nitric and hydrochloric and sulfuric. So when we um, mix an organic acid and an alcohol at the right temperature with an acid acting as a catalyst, often H2SO4, um, we create an ester. Now, in order for you to see the connection, um, I've circled in green where the um, carbonyl is, the double bonded oxygen, and I've circled in orange where the single bonded oxygen is. And so the single bonded oxygen comes from the alcohol and the double bonded oxygen comes from the, carbox, the carboxylate or the carboxylic acid. Now, of course, both the alcohol and the carboxylic acid have, a, have an OH there and there. They both have an OH. But the single bonded oxygen that's in the ester comes from the alcohol, not the carboxylic acid. The carboxylic acid contributes one oxygen, the double bonded one, and the alcohol contributes its only oxygen, the one that ostensibly was part of the hydroxyl group. So you need to remember that when, you, when it comes to naming your ester. When it comes to naming your ester, if we use the old-fashioned name for our two-carbon acid, ethanoic would make this confusing in terms of naming. Don't use ethanoic. So acetic acid 
is going to contribute the double bonded oxygen and my ethanol is going to contribute the single bonded oxygen and the name is going to be with the alcohol first followed by the acid ethanoic acid is ethyl acetate so we begin with the alcohol's name and then we follow up with the beginning of the acid's name and then we end with eight and in the process we kick out a water molecule so this is also a dehydration synthesis lots of vocabulary here a dehydration synthesis and so it's important when we name esters, that we begin with the alcohol name and end in YL, and then we go with the acid name and end in 8. And we know that um, this is where the oxygens go because we can label the oxygens. Ordinary oxygen is oxygen 16. Um, let me erase that and put it on the other side. Ordinary oxygen is oxygen 16, uh, radioactive isotope is oxygen 18. And so you can track this with a meter for measuring radiation. And you can see where the oxygens go. You can either have this as your radioactive oxygen, or this as your radioactive oxygen, or this as your radioactive oxygen, and see where it ends up there. Does it end up here? Does it end up there? Does it end up there? And that's how we know uh, where the oxygens go when you combine acetic acid or some other organic acid with an alcohol to create an ester. Now, another uh, po point that we should make is that the opposite of esterification is going to be a hydrolysis. And so we can go in the opposite direction, which means instead of kicking out a water molecule, like we did up here where we kicked out a water molecule, we can add a water molecule and make the reaction go in the other way. That is hydrolysis. Now, in this particular reaction that, that you see down here, we take our ester and with a strong base, heating it up in water, there's my water, we can make the reaction go back to our carboxylate ion and my alcohol, and then that carboxylate ion, which in this example is sodium acetate from the base sodium hydroxide, um, gives me my ester, um, my sodium acetate, so, uh, my, my ester salt, I should say, and combine it with an acid. Um, and of course, when you have a, ba a base plus an acid, I'm sorry, uh, this uh, salt, sodium acetate, plus this acid, I recreate my original acid. Remember, esters are made of alcohols and acids, so it's a little more complicated process to take my original ester and go backwards to recreate my original alcohol and my original acid. And here are some acids, alcohols, and their esters. And esters are wonderful smelling um, scents. Esters are, are what give fruits, uh, for example, their smell. We can synthesize or use naturally occurring esters in order to make lifesavers and mints and, and artificial flavorings and artificial smells and perfumes. For example, the ester that is made out of acetic acid and this particular alcohol um, 3-methyl-1-butanol will make uh, an ester that has the banana smell. And remember, we begin with the name of the alcohol, which is 3-methyl-butyl, and then we end with the name of the um, acid and, and put the, ac the 8 at the end of the acid's name. So that's the banana smell. And then we can take the butanoic acid with butanol and make pineapple and butanoic acid with benzyl alcohol to make the rose coloring smell. Now, mo rose, of course, has many, many more complicated molecules in it than just benzyl uh, butanoate. And same with all of the others as well. There's usually a mixture of esters to make 
the subtle smells of the different kinds of roses and pineapples and bananas and apples and so and so forth. Methyl salicylate is wintergreen, and of course you've word, worked with salicylic acid when you synthesized aspirin. Um, maybe you've done that. We mix it with wood alcohol, methanol, to make the oil of wintergreen. Might, you might remember from honors chemistry, I'm making some esters. Here's an oil of jasmine. Now we have our amides, amides. Amides have both the carbonyl and the hydroxyl group. Um, combined with my base, the amine, and we kick out a water molecule. So again, it's a dehydration synthesis. And in the process, we link them together to make an amide. So a carboxylate and an amine give me my amide. And these are fibers, for example, in carpets and so forth. We predict an sp2 hybridization and trigonal planar a structure um, around that carbon atom. We're talking about this carbon atom right there, and that would be true. There's a little bit of goofiness going on when it comes to around the, um, the nitrogen. Um, we would think you'd have a tetrahedral, or a pyramidal at least, I should say, um, around the nitrogen because of that lone pair, but there is a um, interesting isomer of this amide that looks more like that and it gives us more of a, tri a trigonal planar and the bond length is even a little bit different than we might normally predict and it's because of this isomer. Now this sp2 hybridization and this altered bond length, I don't think you're going to have to worry about that unusual situation um, on an AP test or if you do, they would tell you about it and ask you to maybe provide some explanation. We can also synthesize amides in big long chains using a peptide link. And peptide links are important in proteins and in um, amides. And these uh, when you have long chains of them, you get polypeptides as uh, shortened chains that make up your proteins. And this was discovered, uh, one of them, acetaminophen, was discovered by accident. And I want to mention the word serendipity. It's almost like um, um, God is saying, you know, I know, I've known about these, these uh, organic compounds in nature, which I've, of course, created for ages. Um, and forever, in other words, and it's about time you guys discovered this and you're kind of behind the ball, behind the, um, uh, behind in discovering it. So he creates these situations where we accidentally discover something. Penicillin was discovered by accident. Other sweeteners were discovered by accident. This acetaminophen was discovered by accident. And um, that's what was, that is what's mentioned here. At this point, you could stop and practice a little bit, but we're going to end the screencast right there.